Welcome to Community Conversations, where we will be bringing you fascinating discussions with local leaders about topics that everybody is talking about. I'm Cindra Sinclair, and I'm your host today, and our special guest is Josh Molina, journalist extraordinaire. So Josh writes news and political stories for NewsHawk. He hosts the lively podcast, Santa Barbara Talks, and he teaches journalism at Santa Barbara City College. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Cinder. It's a pleasure to be here. Wow, you are a busy guy. <laughs> I think I want to thank you for carving out some time for us today. Yeah, no, I am busy, but it's a pleasure to be able to have a conversation with a good friend. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And so, you know, so many things are going on with news today that we all are scratching our heads about. And so I wanted you to come on our show so we could just kind of talk about maybe what people should be looking at, uh, asking themselves about, that sort of thing. So we'll, we'll just, let's just jump in. And, um, you know, when, and I want, also want to say that the thing I love is that we can always count on you. You write articles about everything. We can always count on you to give us sort of breaking news. Yeah. And so my first question is, um, how do you get your, your leads? How, how do you find out when something's happening and you need to hurry up and get somewhere? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, that's a really good question. And I always say journalism is an art. So there's no science for how one person finds stories that it's the same for everybody. It's a complex process, and it's a little bit having good sources. It's a little bit being able to listen to the, the scanner in the newsroom so you kind of hear if there's a traffic accident or if there's a fire or if there's some disaster that public, uh, public safety people are responding to. It's a little bit of that, and it's about being sort of ready to go. Always, because we're not firefighters, we're not police officers, but our role is as important in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be ready to go with whatever happens. I, I live out in Goleta, and there was a hit-and-run accident about a month ago. Uh, a, a person, a, a landscape worker, was working on the side of the road, on the mm -hmm. sidewalk there, tree trimming, and a person in a car hit them, they died, and uh, the, the person allegedly sped from the scene, and there was an arrest, and, and, and so I live in that area, so in that kind of example, you hear on the scanner, and my, my, uh, one of my bosses, Tom Bolton, said, Josh, can you get out there? He heard that there was a traffic accident serious injury. So the scanner traffic, if you listen to it, it's and you have it on the same frequency that the fire department is communicating on or the sheriff's office, then you can kind of listen and know whether to respond or not. Most calls are medical calls. They, they might be falls, trip and falls, mm -hmm. uh, heart conditions, you know, not newsworthy, but stuff where people need need help. So in that case, Tom, who had the scanner with him at the time, I, I, I don't keep a scanner with me all the time. Um, in the newsroom is a different scenario, but I was home at that time. So he asked me to go out there, and I went out there and reported. I, I, I found a place to park, and I walked over, and very sad scene. I, I was talking to the um, eyewitnesses, to the other landscape crew members, and, of course, authorities, trying to piece together what had happened. And I got there so quick, it was before they put the caution tape around the oh, yeah. crime scene. And so in that case, it's a little bit of a combination. It's, it's my editor, it's hearing the scanner, it's asking me to go out there, I'm available. And then it's that on the spot interviewing, that reporting where it's one thing if you get a press release a couple hours later about an accident on Stork Road, mm -hmm. But it's a much better story if you can talk to people who were there. It, it humanizes a tragedy that otherwise people might be 
indifferent to because it doesn't affect them right away. But if they hear about somebody who saw, hear the story of someone who saw it um, and hear about the other workers who, who were affected by this, it personalizes it. It makes it more of a story than just another news report. So that's one example of how we find out about breaking news. We often think of breaking news as crime or accidents, but you know, elections are breaking news, meeting stories, big votes, sports are breaking news because you kind of don't know who's going to win and there's going to be a winner and there's an outcome. And so there's lots of different ways that reporters find stories, but the best way is just being well-sourced, relying on your technology, whether it's an app on your phone to respond to uh, public safety issues or as the scanner and being mobile, being flexible. I, I've been doing this a while and uh, the cool thing about journalism is it never feels like work. It always feels fun, yeah. exciting, and purposeful because people are going to read, they're going to watch, and they're going to be a little bit more informed and smarter because of your, the work that you did. Yeah. And so it feels meaningful. So when you when you love what you do, that's why I'm able to hold so many jobs is because mm-hmm. really I could work 7 days a week for free doing this because it's so <laughs> it's so fun. I mean, I would I would say I practically do, but that's not true anymore, but 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 yeah, you know, it's 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 a job that you do cuz you love it. Well, that comes through loud and clear in your articles, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um the scanner. I don't think I even knew about the scanner. So it's in the newsroom. And so is there always somebody listening to it? Yeah. So in in large newsrooms, there are multiple breaking news reporters or cops reporter, crime reporters, and they have their scanner with them on the desk and they listen so to it. How big is it? Yeah. It's just like a maybe a eight to 10 inch vertical scanner with an antenna. Uh-huh. And you listen to it and you develop kind of an ear. So, you know, if you hear traffic, accident, collision, minor injuries, you're like, no, that's not going to respond. If you hear major injuries, possible fatality, you're like, oh, that's probably a story. I have to, you know, think about reporting. Yeah. And so John Paul Monteri, I'll give you an example. You know, he's got a very lively Instagram page. It's not even a KYT page. It's a just his. It's John Paul Monteri News. And so he's somebody who responds all over town because he has the scanner with him. Oh. And so every news agency has a scanner. So okay. um, I like to report mostly on government, mm-hmm. business, politics, education. So I don't take a scanner with me. But Tom Bolton, our executive editor, he has the scanner. So if you one thing about NewsHawk is, you know, we're, we always have the latest on the yeah car crashes or these (laughs) things because Tom does listen to the scanner. So you can get it at Best Buy. Uh, You can order it online. And um, it's kind of cool. A lot of people like them just for fun because you can kind of hear what's, if you're nosy, you kind of hear what's going on (laughs) in the the community. But yeah, all news agencies, television stations, there's no one out there saying, here's stories, here's stories. So we have to use all of these different ways to learn about potential stories and the technology of the scanner. And now we can have an app on our phone that also does some of that. And so when you say sources, does that mean people that you've developed that they they know that you want them to contact you if they see something going on? Yeah, so uh, sources could could be a lot of different people. It could be law enforcement, it could be public safety, uh, firefighters, it could be the public relations, PIO, or it could be just employees who want to leak something to you or information or an activist. Uh, there are always people who are ready to talk to journalists to share what's happening in the community. Uh-huh. And the more sources you have, the more stories you're going to get. And that's why it's being a journalist is about being social. It's about being somebody who people want to talk to. I mean, I'm very much an introvert. So when I'm not in my journalism role, mm-hmm. I'm very quiet and I like to have good one-on-one conversations with people, but mm-hmm. I'm not the life of the party, okay? But with journalism, with a notebook in my hand or my phone, my recorder, I feel like Superman. Like I feel <laughs> super social and super outgoing. And that's important because 
the public wants to feel as though they can talk to you and share information and trust you with with stories. So sources are are everywhere. Sometimes it's uh, the administrative assistant in an organization who has information to share. Sometimes it's the the CEO or the city manager who has something to share. You have to protect your sources, right? Because people need the ability to share information oh, without yeah, right, right. fear of retribution. And and so so there's a lot of different people that that I talk to who people may not even realize or know. Because who I get, who gets quoted? That's one thing, but. Who tips me off to the story? That's that's a whole yeah. other situation. Oh, gosh. So keep the sources quiet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, what about opinion? I hear people say sometimes, "Well, too much of the news is really opinion these days," and it may be true. I don't know, but but how do you keep when you write your news stories? How do you keep? I mean, you're human, so you must have opinions. So, how do you keep your opinions out of news stories? Well, I, I've always learned that you have more power as a journalist, if you leave your opinion out, because if you put your opinion in a story, you're going to offend somebody. Someone's going to disagree with you and someone's not going to want to talk to you. And so the goal is to, to report truth as, as, as accurately, truthfully as possible to report the news truthfully. But the truth is, 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 complicated. People have multiple perspectives. Yeah. And so if you have opinion in there, the first person who disagrees with you, you lose credibility with them. And so I like to be able to talk to liberals, conservatives, people all over that political spectrum, uh-huh. because they need to feel as though I'm just a journalist who's going to hear them and not judge them. And so I've always learned that you just have more truthful stories when you get a full, complete picture of what's going on. Uh, we all have family members that we know who are politically different than us. We don't shut them out of our lives. We put up with them. We, we, maybe we don't engage in certain conversations, but we don't turn on them. And as a journalist, it's important to not only report and talk to people who you might agree with because that's that's dangerous and we all don't know everything we think we should know today like we're going to learn something from somebody else tomorrow and mm-hmm. hopefully we'll be a little bit better for that you know when you go to journalism school when you're first learning you got to get that beaten out of you right from your teachers that you can't put your opinion because <laughs> People tend to think, well, that's why I want to go into journalism. I want to have a voice. I want to have a perspective. I want to be influential. And you have more influence if you don't have an opinion because more people will hear you. And, and, and that's so. That's such a good point. Yeah. You know, if people, if, if people feel like they can trust you no matter what, no matter what they have to say to you, that's powerful, you know. But if I tell you I'm only going to talk to people who agree with me on this issue, that's half your audience right there. So over time, you learn that you can, you leave your opinion out, but my stories have voice. They have narrative. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, somebody who reads regularly could not see the name and be like, that's a Josh story because I can tell. So you do have ability to have your voice in a story, which is what writers want. Now, uh, there is a place for opinion in newsrooms. There's a reporter and news section, and then some larger papers have opinion and editorials. Mm-hmm. And the idea behind that is, and it's a little bit archaic, but you know, it's before social media when everybody had a platform. But at one time, newspapers were the most credible mm-hmm. institution that would provide information to the public. And so the idea was, we have our reporters, we report on all these issues, so we're poised to offer an opinion on an issue because we have all this information. And so the editorial writers would have an opinion, maybe they'll they'll take a perspective on a political candidate or a local issue, and that's separate, and that's okay. And then, of course, we like opinion columnists, that's different. Yeah. You know, you want to share your unique sure. perspective, and so... That's fine, but it has to be separate. Where people get into trouble is when they try to blur the line and have opinion in a news story. And 
There's, there are problems with media literacy today, and it's, it's really exacerbated by the rise of the internet and social media. People get confused. So television news, I always tell my students, stop watching television news, cable news, not, not your local KYT news programming, but cable news, all the networks, whether they, you agree with that perspective or not, because they're full of opinion. And, and people have, don't distinguish between Tucker Carlson, who's not on the air anymore, but an opinion show versus, or Anderson Cooper mm -hmm. versus an old traditional news. They don't uh, understand that. And then that affects all journalists. That affects the reporter who goes out and just tries to write a story. And so um, it's, it's a challenging time because anyone can start a website and start reporting on things. And we even see that locally, right? Anyone has a platform, they can they can publish. And then social media, yeah. you can say anything you want. And people don't really understand that this person is a journalist that's not a journalist. The, the First Amendment protects everybody, but journalists are trained yeah. to be able to have conversations, gather information. And you gotta have that gene, that gene of, you know, the truth is what matters, not the truth as I would like it to be, mm -hmm. but as it is right now in the real world. And some journalists get that, some, someone, some in school, they get it and they love it and some don't. And yeah. that's fine. I don't want journalists in the industry who are trying to get their yeah. opinion out there. <laughs> what about <laughs> fake news? How can a, you know, nowadays, how, it's, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Do you have any tips for the audience about how to determine fake news. Yeah, so so uh, fake news is an issue in the sense that anyone can start a fancy website on the internet mm -hmm. and start disseminating news and it looks credible. And we see people sharing things on social media from like these random sites. You know, like what is the, the source of this? Uh, you have to look at the name. Like is this name, is this person a real person? Do they have a LinkedIn profile? Mm -hmm. Can you track them? Do they have some sort of history of writing articles? And that's one quick way to know whether this is a legitimate story. And then you also kind of want to look at the other stories that they're publishing on this website. Like, do these make sense or are they not? And also one of the things that comes up with this current technology are deep fakes where people can, like, we can have this video here and then through technology, other words can come out of my mouth and it can look like I'm saying it because the AI technology can put together new words based off of five minutes of my vocabulary. And so that's very dangerous. And yeah. you see that in political campaigns. Uh, there, you know, there was one about, about Nancy Pelosi a few years ago where, you know, she was slurring her words and it was slowed down and it made it look like she was being incoherent. And that's pretty dangerous too. Uh, because if you, see Joe Biden talking, you're assuming that's what he's saying, but actually not. Like it could be very much uh, uh, a deep fake, you know, technology putting words in someone's mouth. So uh, hopefully, you know, that does not become something where it's like this national disaster because we think somebody's saying something and they're not. But uh, media literacy is important, Read reading a lot. So you develop that ear of, this story doesn't make sense. This is not true. And then also just Verifying. So if you see some story, it says aliens have landed. Well, go see if the other outlets have that same story. And if they don't, then probably it's not a credible source. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's really helpful. Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's switch to some local issues that pe I hear people talking about. So one of our favorite ones, uh, State Street. So I read an article actually that, that you wrote, I think it was like last year, um, letting us know that uh, the city had agreed to almost $800,000 to pay a, out of uh, the area expert mm -hmm. uh, to help save our beloved State Street. So do you have an update or do you know how that's going or do you have any ideas about that to share? Yeah, that, that contract was to help create a State Street master plan. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that the pandemic forced the closure of nine blocks of State Street mm -hmm. because restaurants could not seat people indoors. So the 
the governor, right, said you can have outdoor seating. And then the state, the, the, the city of Santa Barbara closed State Street so restaurants could stay in business. Uh, it never reopened again. And, and so we have the downtown that is closed to vehicles. So people are eating outdoors. As part of that, it's, there's this re- reimagining of what this downtown could look like. So some people want the cars to come back. Some people want pedestrians. Some people want bikes. A lot of people hate the electric bikes. A lot of people say they're not safe. Uh, some people don't like the skateboarders or the dogs, right? So all these people have these perspectives. And so the master plan is trying to figure out what if we could just do anything we wanted, what would it be, okay? Yeah. And so there's some talk of making it flat, you know, so no more curbs, just a flat area, mm-hmm. having a bike lane, pedestrian lane, maybe a, a trolley or some sort of vehicle that drops mm-hmm. people off because it's a little bit of a generational conversation. If, if you're of an age where hopping on an electric bike is fun for you and easy, then that's a great downtown experience. But if you're somebody who moves a little bit slower or maybe you use a, cha- a wheelchair, it's not very fun to be down there when all that's happening. And so all of these things are of, of uh, consideration. There have been multiple proposals, multiple public meetings. It's a lot. People have a lot of perspective. So the latest is that MIG, the consultant, has come back with drawings, pretty pictures, colorful, what it could look like, multiple examples. And eventually it'll go to the city council and, and they will, they will hash it out. It doesn't look like cars are going to return to State Street ever, at least those blocks, but there may be some trolley or shuttle or golf cart that maybe drops people off in, in certain areas. The Granada Theater, for example. Um, if you're, you're a senior citizen and, you know, their population might be tending to show, um, it's easier maybe to get dropped off in front than it is to, to park and walk and deal with all of that. So, so you feel like that master plan is on track for completion at some point? Yeah, so next year, early next year, there's going to be formal recommendations to the council. It's taken a long time. We don't know how long it's going to take. In private business, you tend to get things done really quickly. But when it comes to government, it's a public process. It's a public expenditure of funds. You have to be inclusive of all these different opinions. So things take longer. And consultants, you get paid by for thinking. So, you know, they might want to stretch it out a little bit too. So, yeah. uh, but yeah. it's on track in the sense of, I think March or April, mm-hmm. it's going to go for the count before the council. And maybe yeah. by the end of next year, they'll have a plan. But the other part of that is there's no funding for how, what are we going to do down there? Are we, if we're going to put, uh, nice uh, pavement or nice roads, sidewalks, if we level it off, uh, it's going to cost money. And so that'll be the next thing is where does the money come from to pay for, for all of this? Yeah, that yeah. should be interesting too. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> It'll give you lots to write about. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> lots for us to read about. So um, let's talk about affordable housing. Everybody's talking about that and rightfully so. It's a, it's a problem on many levels. And uh, I think not too long ago this year, you wrote an article about how uh, they're going to tear down the Paseo Nuevo and they're going to build, I don't know, four or 500 housing units there. And, uh, but other affordable housing projects, do you have any thoughts on how that's going? Well, the state is mandating that local governments build more housing because For years, some communities did not build enough affordable housing and housing to accommodate the population. So instead of leaving it up to these local jurisdictions to do it, the state has said, we're going to make it really easy for developers to build. And so we're seeing those pressures all over California and especially coastal California. Mm -hmm. And Santa Barbara is kind of built out, meaning there isn't a lot of wide open space to go build a bunch of apartments. So the city is looking at infill, looking at areas to build housing to accommodate really all levels of income 
Mm -hmm. The housing authority serves the most poor, Section 8 uh, vouchers. And then there's a lot of people in the middle who aren't millionaires who, you know, maybe they, they make a hundred grand a year between the two, uh, uh, you know, if it's a two person parent household, they might make that, but it's not enough to really buy a house and, yeah. but you don't qualify for low income housing. And so the city is also trying to work to, to build what's called missing middle housing. Mm -hmm. So the, that group, and then all levels, there's very low income, low income, moderate income, upper middle income. And so all of that is happening. We need more housing. We, we definitely do because regardless of what you think about why we need more housing, <laughs> um, it's a quality of life issue. Like people, families, uh, there are still people who live in Tura, Oxnard, Lompoc, Santa Maria, who commute to work in Santa Barbara, Goleta, South Coast, and then they leave the community and go back. Mm -hmm. And that's not good for Highway 101 traffic congestion. And it's not good if you just don't want to spend two hours or an hour and a half in a car. And a community is stronger when you can shop and, and where you work, where your kids can go to school, where you work. And so it's would be nice to figure out a way to have more people live where they work because Santa Barbara and Goleta have jobs, but the cost of housing is so outrageous and it's a little more affordable in these other areas. But these issues come up, you know, is that these uh, elected officials during election year will talk about, we need more housing, we need more housing. But a lot of the housing that's being built is market rate housing. So we're like five grand for a two bedroom or something once it's finally built. I was like, well, that's not really helpful. I mean, five grand is more than the mortgage that yeah. uh, me and my wife have to pay. Because, yeah. I mean, you you have a down payment and you refi Like the, the five grand is ridiculous yeah. for, um, you know, a, you're not investing in yourself. You're investing in, you know, an owner. So who's going to use that money, you know. So uh, that's kind of the challenge. How do you build housing that's affordable for people who are not going to use it as like a second apartment or the tech workers mm -hmm. who already make a lot of money mm -hmm. who can already afford to live here? That's the challenge. And elected officials will say housing, 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 housing. What they really should be saying is affordable housing only. But the problem with that, though, is that the developers will say, we can't build all affordable housing and give it away because we won't, it won't pencil out for us. We won't, we need to make profit. We're the developers. So we need to charge market rate. And so it's this sort of circle and yeah. uh, developers want more density. They want to be able to build more. Say, so we you want more that it's affordable. Let us build higher. Yeah. But nobody in Santa Barbara wants anything to be higher. Yeah. So it's this little circle of. What's, you know, nothing ever changes. We have a little more housing than we did five years ago, but it's not enough. Um, you know, and even when you think about the benefit to our community of having more people here, you know, during the debris flow, people were saying that the first responders couldn't even get here because they live down there in Ventura or other places and the freeway was closed. And so it, benefits us on a whole lot of levels to have affordable housing. Exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, some um, law enforcement do not want to live in the community where they work because of, um, you know, they don't want to be recognized in the grocery store by someone who they may have apprehended, arrested, or family member. There's a little bit of privacy that they enjoy by, by being separate from the law that they're enforcing. But... It's not all of them, right? Yeah. It's just like a little bit of it. And yeah, we we would want them to be as close as possible yeah. <laughs> and not check out three days a week in another community, yeah. which which does happen because it's more affordable. And then the other thing is recruitment. Like if you can, if you're living in Ventura, Oxnard, and you can get a job there, eventually you're just going to leave. And then with experience comes wisdom in all professions. Mm -hmm. And if you have a constant churn of rookies in journalism and law enforcement, <laughs> it takes a while for you to yeah. develop that knowledge to kind of be the best you can be. 
And so that's also a factor too, is recruitment and retention with, yeah, yes. with ha- the housing situation. Yep, yep. I know you write several articles on, you, you, you attend school board meetings sometimes yeah. and write articles on that. Do you have any thoughts on, um, you know, any uh, important issues that are affecting our school system here in Santa Barbara? Yeah, so I cover schools and there's always something going on mm-hmm. with the Santa Barbara Unified School District, but uh, there's an achievement gap. I think now they're calling it the opportunity gap, <laughs> but uh, students, uh, to, you know, and this is true all across California, but white students test much higher than students of color. And in this community, it's uh, Hispanics, you know, Latinos. And so that's an issue that uh, obviously is important to address. And there are a lot of factors with that. And I think that if there's any way to make smaller class sizes, that's really important. That teacher to student ratio will equalize some of the challenges that some students have. If, you know, tying back to the housing, if you live in an apartment and maybe you share that apartment with other family members and you don't have your own space, it's hard to focus on being the best student you can. And maybe both of your parents are working some couple of jobs. Um, you can't expect that all of a sudden when you walk into a classroom, everyone's equal. Everybody can perform the same on the test because not everybody's prepared the same. And so if you can reduce the sizes of these classes so students get more attention, that'd be really significant. Um, a lot of the independent schools, the private schools do that. They, mm-hmm. you know, people are paying out of pocket for that, but they have smaller class sizes. And that's, that's, you know, the, the research shows that more class time Right, those are longer school days, mm-hmm. more days in the classroom leads to better results. But also, in addition, class sizes, teacher to student ratios, and so uh, that that is something I think that would be uh, worth pursuing and worth uh, investing in. You know, I grew up in I was born in Goleta, uh, I, you know, poor by. Our California standards, you know, I always know there's always people worse off than me around the country and the world. But, you know, we, we rented, we lived in apartments. So we moved every year, my parents. When the rent went up, we would move. And so, oh and so I went to five different elementary schools. Uh, that's really hard to be the best student you can be when you never get settled. Okay. And so there are some kids who have to deal with that. The house I grew up in, Old Town Goleta is a cannabis dispensary. Well, not the one I grew up in, the first one I lived in, is a cannabis dispensary. And it's, people have just different experiences. And, and you know, we, we're not all poised to be successful equally when we walk mm-hmm. into a classroom. And so I think that the school district should do more to have high standards, accountability, and give students an opportunity to be successful. And you might remember this, you know, like I remember it when I was in schools, the extroverts get all the attention, the ones who raise their hand. And a kid like me in the back of the classroom who's, you know, worried about what they're wearing, like are my clothes as nice as this person? Um, I'm, I'm eating public lunch, so am I gonna be judged? Like those things on your mind, yeah play a factor in your ability to be the best student you can be. And so I think we need to recognize that as a school system. And I, I like a lot of people is like, well, the schools need to fix everything. And like, why aren't the test scores higher? It's like, it's very complicated. You, you can't also expect the school district to raise your children either. It's, 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 there's so many different factors that, that are involved here. But I would say, Increasing the performance of our lower achieving students is absolutely should be a goal of the school district. And we are, we did see a little bit of increase, but then we go back to the pandemic, of course, that learning loss. Yeah. And it was exacerbated there because, you know, then you're relying on technology, right? And you're relying on Wi Fi connection. And yeah. it's hard, if it's hard to learn in a classroom, 
it's even harder to learn on a computer, you know? So, yeah, yeah. so there's all those factors too. Uh, Santa Barbara Unified School District has a relatively new superintendent and mm -hmm. the entire cabinet, the le senior leadership is turned over. So that's been an issue. The teachers are unhappy with their salaries right now. They're yeah. talking of a, a strike. Um, there's always drama over union negotiations, mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of issues in Santa Barbara Unified yeah. right now, but focusing on students should be their number one priority and in, in increasing um, test scores and, and also mm -hmm. just helping all students be, be successful. Uh, last thing on this, like I went to Dos Pueblos High School. I never took the SAT. And so my wife, we would talk about it later. She's like, what'd you get on your SAT? And I'm like, I never took the SAT. No one ever asked me to take the SAT. It was never, I never went to a workshop, no, no counselor. I don't even know what an SAT was till later in college, you know? And so, um, those little things incrementally add up. And so I'd love to see a school system where everybody's provided the same access to. Yeah to information. But my son took the SAT, so oh. he made up for it for me. So. <laughs> he probably got really high school. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think, um, you know, when you go to the board meetings, all do you think that most of the board members uh, and maybe even the admin people, do they understand some of these issues, like the smaller classroom and like how complicated it is to make sure everybody has the same access? Yeah, I think they do, but they're also elected. And some people who are elected are looking at the next thing they're going to get elected to. And some people are just happy to be in the position they're in. Mm -hmm. And they're professionals in other fields. Like they get elected and they oversee. But to understand uh, the budget for a, you know, a school district is very difficult. Professionals go to school to learn this. And so the people who really run the schools is the superintendent and the hired cabinet members. Uh -huh. And they're the decision, they have all the power. So these board meetings, they actually don't disagree very often from what the superintendent wants because they're the expert. And so I think they understand it, but they also yeah. defer to the superintendent and superintendent and the cabinet, they have a viewpoint, which is, yes, they care, but they also have constraints and they have laws and there's only so much they can do. They can't go out and hire a whole bunch of new teachers if yeah. the budget isn't there. And a lot of teachers, you know, they may not want to work in Santa Barbara because they can go work somewhere else for more money. Yeah. Right, the right, Goleta right. Union pays more than Santa Barbara Unified. So you might want to work in Goleta because, you know, it's just a better better job opportunity yeah. there. Okay, so let's just shift gears just a little. Um, how did you develop your love of journalism? Yeah, well, uh, when I went to Santa Barbara City College out of DP, I was an accounting major. So can you, if you can a believe county. that. Yeah, and I was decent. Like, it was good. It was like someone told me, oh, you're good. Go do that. But I took a journalism class um, as an elective. I took Journalism 101. It looked interesting from reading the description. And I loved it. It was, it was awesome. And I wasn't good at all. In fact, Patricia Stark, who was my journalism teacher, she hated me. Like, and she was, she was, she was hard. Like she was <laughs> tough. She had high standards. But it worked for me. She told me, you can't write. Like she just... And she asked me, she's like, what do you read? Do you read anything at all? Because I was, whatever my skill level was, she saw it as you can be much better than this. And so she had high standards. So she, she said, you have something there, but you need to read more right now. Go read anything, oh. read a book, read a magazine. You need to understand mm -hmm. uh, the, the rhythm and the voice of what news writing is like. And so I took that class and I think I got a B, that J101 class, and I struggled through it. But then I joined the student newspaper. And from there, it was just like, well, this is so fun because a lot of the journalists that I've met and the ones I've taught were introverts. Like we, we, we have a lot to say, 
but we haven't found a platform to do it in yet. And so once we find journalism, we find out, oh, I can talk to this person, this person, that person. I can do a little research and I can create a story out of nothing. What's a blank screen is now a little piece of history that I've created. So empowering. You're like, wow, <laughs> I did that. And then you can show it to people and it's tangible. And so once you feel that, it's addicting. Right. It's addictive. And then once you do a few stories where maybe you hold the administration accountable or people start to say, liked your story, it feels really good. And all of a sudden you have that, that validation. Yeah. And I think a lot of jobs, you don't get that. Right. And it's yeah, just yeah. like, you just kind of do your work and you get paid. And so I really enjoyed it. And so I was able to uh, become an editor on the student newspaper and I wrote so many stories that pissed off the administration and, and, and <laughs> you know, and that's, that's what I like to do. Uh, so <laughs> people always say, why do journalists always write about bad news? Okay. Oh, it's like, Oh yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's like, we don't write about bad news because we enjoy it. We write about systems that are broken. Like there's an expectation that systems should work a certain way that we should have services that take care of our needs, that we should have housing, that we should not have crime. Like there are things that we expect from our social contract mm -hmm. through our taxpayer dollars. And so when there's a breakdown in the system, when somebody's embezzling money, when somebody's stealing money, when there's an abuse of power, yeah. there's a, a me too situation, like we have to write about that. We have yeah. to hold, yeah, yeah these people accountable. So it's not about being negative. You know, we don't write about the fact that the sun rose today and the sun set because the better, that better happened today. Yeah. <laughs> but if it doesn't rise and it doesn't set, that's a story <laughs> because there's a conflict and we need to hold our institutions accountable. And I've always liked that uh, as a student journalist and then and then after that, so, and I, I, uh, Patricia, eventually she hired me to teach at City College of oh, uh, 20, 15 years later. And, uh, you know, she would say that, you know, I'm one of her, her best success stories. And I, and, you know, I, and that's, you know, me and my teacher role, I really take pride in that. And people always tell me as a teach, uh, the students say, I mean, I've had people say, you're the best teacher I've ever had. And I'm not like a, professor who has got this photographic mastery of knowledge and can just download to you every possible thing I've ever known. That's not my style. My style is to make you feel in the classroom as though you are empowered and capable of anything and arm you with the knowledge that you can make a difference in this world. And I've had students, two of them, and I remember this, two different semesters, two different classes say, you're the first teacher I've ever had who made me feel strong enough to raise my hand and, te and, and talk in class. Yeah. And that's like the highest compliment oh, because that's yeah. something they'll take with them anywhere. And so I was able to prove to Patricia that I was a, you know, a good student so much so that she hired me for that, yeah. that job later. But I've always loved it. It is a sickness. Um, the downside of this industry is... Um, Divorce rates are high. Alcoholism is right, high. People get so caught up in the chase of the story and that byline and that public affirmation oh, really? that they, that's all they want. And then they neglect themselves. They neglect their families. They're not present parents. And it's, I mean, I guess that's true in a lot of really industries where you're super successful celebrities or something, yeah. you know, and journalism, you don't make a lot of money, but you do have impact. And so the downside of it is it is addictive. Like you just love it. Fortunately, I kind of lost that early. Like I kind of learned once I had my, my son, like nothing is more important. Like I'm not going to work till eight o'clock so I can have a big story and be better than the other newspaper in town. It's not important to me. I'm gonna do the best job I can so I can be home. And that's important to learn and know because when I was, you know, in my early 20s, I, like, I wanted to be the best reporter ever and win all the <laughs> awards and 
you learn like that's that's very uh, shallow and it's fleeting and it doesn't last. And so um, that's the downside of loving what you do. Yes, Don't yes. love it so much that you exclude everything else. <laughs> yeah. you know? that, oh, golly. That is a good word. So um, you've kind of reinvented yourself over the last few years. You know, you to journalism, you've added um, your podcast and your teaching. Yeah. So how how did that happen? How is that for you? Yeah, I um, so I you know my career is kind of like weird and it's unusual because I kind of had to figure a way to out to do, figure a way to do it. I worked at the Santa Barbara News Press. There was a big ethical scandal. I I quit there in two thousand six, and that was on in some ways like the worst thing that ever happened to me professionally because my son was one year old and. You're just at the start of your like life, right? You're like family, kids, you're quitting your job with no income at all. Like what's wrong with you? But as you know, it's, that's another story, but yeah, that, you know, yeah. Jerry Roberts, mass accidents, the whole thing. And so I, um, went and got a job at the, the San Jose Mercury News and I worked there two and a half years and that was awesome. But the Bay Area is so big and I'm a small town kind of guy. Like, I love the news of a big city, but quality of life, I, I like mm -hmm. simplicity. And so um, my wife didn't want to move to the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So I ended up commuting from Solvang, where we bought our first house, to San Jose. And so I would leave every Sunday morning, and I had a little studio, and then I'd come back Thursday night. And... My son was one. And, you know, around that age, um, they need mom, you know, like, or like food, you know. Yeah. But once he turned three, he started to get sad and cry when I would leave. Yeah. I'm like, I can't do this. You know, I just, I just, I'd rather do any, I'd rather work at McDonald's and be home, you know. And so, so I quit and I came back. And so that's when the reinvention started. I wanted to be there for my son and be present. But this is not a big media market. Like, you're not going to make a lot of money as a journalist in this town. And so I got a job at this Hispanic business magazine, and that was decent money, but it was more marketing, B2B. It wasn't really like that watchdog stuff yeah, I like. Yeah. And then Patricia Stark, she called me and said, I have a class. My teacher bailed on me. They don't want to do it. Uh, can you teach a J101 class for me? And I need to know by the end of the week. I'm like, <laughs> okay. You know, you don't say no to Patricia, I learned, right? You just figure out how to do it. And so I said yes. And so then I became, oh, I like this teacher thing. And then more classes came, right? And then I eventually figured out a way to get back into, into journalism. And so I kind of cobbled together the journalism, the teaching, and that's enough, right? That's a way to make it sort of work. And I, I started teaching at Cal State Northridge too, so even more classes. I'd love an opportunity to work as a full-time teacher, but Santa Barbara City College is like a department of one, you know? It's not like journalism is growing, yeah. you know? Um, so I've cobbled together all these things. And the podcast was an idea, I, I, I don't know. At some, at some point you start to become aware of your mortality. You know, like when I was in my twenties, I never thought about dying. I never thought, I thought I would live forever. I thought, you know, the, the horns would blow and God would come down in the escalator and swoop me up and, you know, I'd go to heaven. I never have to die to get there. Right. Like that's, and, but then like, I'm like, wow, I'm getting old now, you know, and I just had all this body of work. And then I had these kids and I'm like, I would love to somehow leave some kind of legacy for them. And I don't know if they're ever going to read the newspaper articles. So I thought, and I don't even own my content. Like the news press articles are owned by a company that went out of business. I can't even find them anymore unless I go to the public library. And so I thought I really love to own my own content. So I started the podcast. And so I have these video conversations with people that'll, you know, be there forever, theoretically, as long as YouTube yeah. exists, which <laughs> yeah. I think is going to be a long time. And, and, and that can happen. The other part of it was, so I want my kids to be able to watch those later. My daughter's 10, like, like, oh, Josh had a good, dad had a good conversation. The other part was, as you know, 
I have these great interviews with these people and I'd take down a few notes and record. What would go into the story would be maybe a quote, you know, 10% of the interview would get published and everything else is just gone except in my head. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if just the whole interview was there and people, if they wanted more, could get it? And so that's the other thing is they get to hear directly from the source, mm -hmm. not me filtering out the two quotes from my story. They get yes, to hear the whole thing. It. And some people say, well, that's too much, too long. Well, don't watch. You watch 20 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah. It is whatever. But I really enjoy it. And I uh, uh, try to get sponsorships for it. I have gotten sponsorships. And I'd love to focus more on that. But, you know, it brings in a little bit of revenue yeah. for me as well for my time. But um, I, en I, en I enjoy it. And it's, it's, you have to reinvent yourself as a journalist. I mean, I teach multimedia classes, photography. Like, that's another thing. It's like I'm constantly having to stay up to date on what, you know, the next generation is learning. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You do. Yeah. A lot of your students are very young. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Josh, what a blessing you are to this community. Such an extraordinary journalist that you share with all of us. And the podcast, I've watched that several times, and that is really interesting. And as you know, I'm also a student in your class, and I know what a great teacher you are. So thank you for all of your important work and for sharing it with our audience. Well, thank you. I, it's a pleasure to have met you this year, and you're kind of one of those uh, bright lights that is in mm -hmm. the community. And like from afar, you know, I recognize you, like, and you write for Newshawk too. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh, that's interesting, Claire. But it's been a pleasure to get to know you because you're you're one of these people who brings the best out of other people oh, and thank you. makes them feel um, meaningful and important. So oh. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for joining us on Community Conversations, and we'll see you next time.